Good evening, and welcome to Wednesday Night Alive. It is so strange that we don't get to be here together in person, just like on worship on Sunday morning. But right now with the pandemic and the way things are, we believe that it is still the responsible and the safe thing to do for us to be able to be growing in our faith while we're not together here in the sanctuary. We are anxious to have them back together. Absolutely. We miss you guys so very, very much. And we know that come the fall, I cannot help but believe we'll finally be able to be back together, having a great dinner, be back studying together. But for this semester, everything is going to be online. So I hope you'll enjoy our course, but I hope you'll be considering taking all the other courses that are going to be offered because there truly are some great ones. Wendy and I have been thinking about this, and we're excited about teaching, Are You Tired of Fighting Yet? Now, this is a course in which we're really going to be looking at the culture of our world right now. Specifically, we're also going to be looking at politics and, and how it's affecting us and what's going on in the world. And how do we deal with this? How do we make sense and be at peace rather than being so polarized and ramped up or depressed? You know, this has been a time that's been hard on people's spirits. And so we want to talk about this issue of are you tired of fighting yet? And how in the world do we believe people can get along? So that's what we're going to want to look at. I think it's going to be a great time, and I'm so grateful that you've decided to join us. Why don't we start tonight with a word of prayer? Oh God, we are so very grateful for this evening, for this opportunity to come together to study your word to grow in our trust in you, to strengthen our faith. Oh God, we give you thanks for the gift of your love and we pray that you would help all of us to open our hearts and minds to the leading of your spirit so that in the midst of chaotic times, we might feel a sense of peace and we might live our lives in such a way that we help to share your love and bring hope to all. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to tell you a little bit about Arthur C. Brooks. He is the author of the book that we'll be using for this class, Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America from a Culture of Contempt. Um, I'll be using probably his full name, Arthur C. Brooks, because it always sounds to me, if I just go by his last name, it sounds like I'm referring to my son. So Arthur C. Brooks is a Harvard business professor he was named by Fortune Magazine as one of the top 50 world leaders today. Now he started out of college as a professional musician. He played the French horn and he was part of a quintet and then he traveled with an orchestra. But he went back to school and he earned his PhD in public policy analysis. He's originally from Seattle, but now he lives in Massachusetts with his wife and his three children. Now he'll tell you in the book, he's not a member of either party, but he tends to lean uh, to the right. He would consider himself more central in his political ideology, but he does lean to a more conservative side. He is a fascinating guy in the way that he looks at life and he speaks all the time to different people. I loved one of his comments in which he said, you know, um, political opinions are a lot like noses. Everybody has one, but they're all different. How true that is. We all have our political opinions, and yet they are different. And that's really okay. The issue is, how do we deal with one another? You know, right now, it has been said that our nation is more polarized than at any time since the Civil War. That we are more at each other and we are more divided than at any other time since the Civil War. And you really sense this by the rhetoric that you and I hear all the time from television, from politicians, what we hear in entertainment. I mean, you hear it all the time. But I got to thinking about, you know, this isn't the, the first time that people have said nasty things about each other in politics. I know that right now I believe, I think in my lifetime, it's probably the, the meanest and nastiest time that I have heard. 
But sometimes we kind of get this idealistic view that it's somewhere back there. It was always very kind and sweet and, and that people were respectful of one another. So I went back to do a little bit of reading of some of the things that have been said in the past about people. There was um, John Adams who was writing to Thomas Jefferson. So this is going to be way back there now. Uh, he was writing about Alexander Hamilton. Je uh, Adams did not have a good view of of Hamilton, and so he wrote to Jefferson and said, When perfidy, treachery, imbecility, ignorance, fanaticism, and fury surround us all, puppets danced upon the wires of a bastard brat of a Scottish peddler. Now that, that ranks up there's a pretty nasty thing to say about somebody. It was Horace Greeley who was talking about Lewis Cass. Back in uh, 1848, Lewis Cass ran unsuccessfully as the uh, Democratic candidate for president in 1948. And he was writing, a, Horace Greeley was writing a letter to uh, Shiler Colfax in 1848, and he wrote, The candidate is a pot-bellied, mutton-headed, cucumber-soled Cass. It's rough. In the nicest thing I've heard somebody called. Um, it was said in the Cincinnati Gazette in 1828, an article about General Jackson. He was running for president. General Jackson's mother was a common prostitute brought to this country by the British soldiers. She afterwards married a mulatto man whom she had several children, of which number General Jackson is one. That, none of that was true, but of course... As we have learned, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. It gets said, and how many people wind up believing it. There was an attack um, on Adams, um, and this attack was actually made by... Uh, mm, may have been actually Thomas Jefferson. Um, I'm not sure, but he said of him, Adams is a hideous hermaphroditical character which has neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. You know, we have said mean things about each other down through these last couple of centuries when people are in politics. And so for most historians to be able to say that at this moment we are more divided than at any time since the Civil War and that we've become harsher and meaner than at any other time, that has to say something about how we really are acting towards one another. You know, right now our partisan leaders, they seem to be, instead of trying to bring us together, um, they depict our differences in unabridgeable apocalyptic terms. You know, I listen to the way that my kids, uh, that people are talking to one another, and I think, I would have never let my kids talk like this to each other. I mean, you wouldn't have let Brooks and Hannah grow up saying these kinds of things to each other or about each other or about their friends when they were in school. I mean, that was a rule we had in our family. You don't call people names stupid, idiot, or any of these sorts of things. And yet our children and grandchildren are growing up hearing it every day, how politicians are talking about one another, but how people talk about each other. It doesn't matter whether it's in the movies or the entertainment business, whether it's going to be in sports. It's amazing how we feel free to call each other the most vile names and we somehow seem to think that that is okay. As we go through this course, we're going to look at why is that the case? What has happened in our culture and our society in the past 10, 15 years that have really brought about this change in a phenomenal way where we believe we can be so rude and vile towards one another and we seem to be losing that common decency, a, a sense of manners, a sense of respect. I wouldn't have let my children say that growing up. I don't hear my grandchildren saying that growing up. And I really think that all of us, we can do better. We can't stop what everybody else out there is saying, but you and I can think about what we're saying 
And do we add to the problem or do we bring a, a greater answer to what's going on? You know, one of the things I, I, I've been thinking about when I've been listening to such um, anger, the diversity that people are sharing and, and saying about one another, and it's just the fact that, you know, I, I think that whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or independent, most of us all want the same thing. And when you stop and think about it, if you ask what's the end goal of politics or what's the thing we hope for everybody, we would all have pretty much the same thing that we're all striving for or believe should happen. I mean, you think about it. What does everybody think you should have? Should you be able to feel safe? Should we be safe to walk in our neighborhoods, our streets, safe from foreign governments and terrorism? Should we have a home where we can be comfortable? Where if it's cold outside, we're warm inside? If it's hot outside, can we be cool inside? Can we have a roof over our head to protect us from the elements, to keep us safe in a place where we can sleep? We feel like everybody should be able to have a home. Do we have food to eat? I mean, it grieves us when we see people going hungry. We all should be able to have something to eat. At the church, we're trying so hard, boy, through this last year in this pandemic, as so many people have lost their jobs and have faced hunger. We have heard our call and responsibility as a family of faith to step up and do something about that. We believe everybody should have something to eat. I believe everybody should have a job that's meaningful. We all want to do something with our lives that we feel we enjoy doing, something that is helpful, brings meaning to our lives, a way by which we can earn a reasonable living and we can survive. I would wish that for everybody. Education. I'm so grateful that I was able to get an education as a child growing up, that my mom and dad wanted to make sure that I was able to go to college, that I was able to go to seminary. I wanted an education. I wanted my children to have an education, my grandchildren. But I see how important it is for everybody to have an education. Who would say we're not concerned about educating our children? Healthcare. I'm so incredibly grateful that I can go see a doctor or go to the hospital if I have a need. I want to be able to have access to health care. I want everybody to be able to have access to health care. Who, again, would want to say, well, I don't think that child over there should be able to have health care. No, we all want that. To worship. I am so grateful that I live in a country where I am free, that I can worship as I feel fit. So many of, of our forefathers and mothers sacrificed so much to give us that freedom. And I would wish that everybody has that freedom to be able to worship God in the way that they see fit. Now, you listen to just some of these things. Some of this, these are things that we would all want for each other. And if you ask all politicians, I think they would say, absolutely, they want that for all of the people that they represent. So really the real issue, the real question here that we're going to be dealing with is this question of how do you get there? How do you make these things happen? It really is the question. How do you get all this for people? Do you cut taxes or do you tax and spend? Do we expect people to take personal responsibility or do we help them? Do we provide welfare? Do you need to have a free market health care system? Do we need to have universal health care? A right to bear arms. But what do we believe about gun control? You know, no one who argues for the right to bear arms or gun control wants a mass shooting. Nobody wants a mass shooting, regardless of where you stand on the issue. Over and over, we all want the same end goal. We just differ on how to get there and how do we accomplish this. We disagree on what we should do. And then what happens is we start to demonize, 
those who think differently from us. It's not that we really have a different end goal so much as we differ in how we achieve the things that we all believe are fundamental needs, rights that we have as human beings, as Americans. And when people think differently from us about how to accomplish that, that's when we get into this argument, demonizing one another and, and causing such a great struggle. It's sad how we can basically all have the same goals and believe the same rights for all people and yet still come to a point where we're demonizing uh, people who had the same goals and ideals as us. Again, it centers around how we get there. Arthur C. Brooks was speaking at an event in New Hampshire in 2014, and the event was a group of conservative, conservative activists, and there was a whole slate of speakers. Most of them uh, were politicians. He was the only uh, person who was speaking who wasn't a politician, and he was kind of excited about the event. Uh, he speaks at all sorts of events to a wide variety of audiences, but this one he felt uh, very confident. He didn't feel like there was anything uh, controversial about his speech. He was there to talk about the perceptions of liberals and conservatives in America today. And so he was speaking to this uh, group of uh, conservative people, this crowd, and he made the comment that there is a wide perception of liberals being compassionate and empathetic and that conservatives should work to achieve that same kind of perception on them. Afterwards, a woman approached him and she was livid. Now, before she said anything, he thought she was going to really take issue with the fact that he hadn't said that liberals are, or excuse me, that conservatives were the ones that should be perceived as compassionate and empathetic. But she was mad that he had characterized liberals in a positive light at all. She was furious that he said that there was a perception of them being compassionate, empathetic, and that as a public figure, he had a responsibility to tell the truth. And she said that the truth of the matter was that all liberals were stupid and evil. That's the truth. Now, as soon as she said that, he said that he thought about Seattle. He grew up in Seattle. And he said, Seattle is one of the most liberal places in the United States. And his father is a professor there and his mother is an artist. And he said, if you're a professor or an artist in Seattle, what do you think the political swing of those kind of people are there? They're very liberal. And so here are his parents who are very liberal and this woman wanted him to speak what she called the truth and that all liberals were evil and stupid. And so she was pushing him in a corner where he had to either choose his loved ones or choose an ideology that said uh, conservatives were all good and liberals were all evil and stupid. And that was the choice she was giving him. He said that either I admit that those with whom I disagree politically, including people I love, are stupid and evil, or I renounce my ideas and credibility as a public figure. Now this kind of uh, only this or only that thinking is affecting all of us. In a Reuters poll uh, that was done in 2017, it found that one in six Americans stopped talking to a family member or a close friend because of the 2016 election. It'd be interesting to find out what that poll would look like today. But one in six stopped talking to a family member or a close friend 
because of the election. They let politics and that political divide divide their relationships. And that trend is growing. And yet we know the most important thing is for us to be able to talk with one another. It's only really when you talk to one another, even if they disagree, that we're able to finally start to understand one another, to get to know each other. And what we're beginning to really realize more and more as a country is we are, we've stopped talking to one another, getting to know one another. We're going to look at that again through the course of some of the sociological things that are happening right now in our country. To think that you're going to stop talking to a family member or a good friend because they hold a different political view. What we need to be doing is talking to one another. I, I love right in, the, in his book when he's talked about it, and you've talked about it in a sermon, I've talked about it in a sermon, but it was the story of Hawk Newsom and Tommy Hodges. It was back, I believe it was in 2014, that they were holding a, uh, or it wouldn't have been 14, it would have been after that 2016 or 17, I guess. It was, it was the, um, what was called the mother of all rallies in the Washington, D.C. Mall. Uh, Tommy Hodges was the one who was lining this up, and it was going to be a rally for Trump supporters. It was going to be there in the Washington Mall, the mother of all rallies. And it was going to turn out a huge crowd. Hawk Newsom, well, he was the New York, he was the leader of Black Lives Matter in New York. He was the head person. He had been there in Charlottesville, Virginia for the demonstration and when things broke out into a riot. Uh, he had been hit in the head with a rock and he still um, had some bruises from that. But he wanted to come to this rally and he was there to protest along with a number of other African American people. They had brought their signs. They came with the whole purpose of helping to have a different voice there at this rally of chanting, demanding rights. I mean, they wanted to have a counter rally at the midst of this um, mother of all rallies and they wanted to have something different to say. Now it's fascinating when you, when you get to know um, Hawk Newsom. I mean, he's a tall, good looking, strong guy. He is a person of faith. He is a Christian. He is standing up for something he believes in so strongly. He was at Charlottesville, as I said, and when things started to go bad, he grabbed a rock that he was going to start throwing as he had been hit by a rock. And he said, out of nowhere, he said, there was this older white woman standing beside him. And he looked down at her and she said, all you need is your voice. That is your weapon. It was with that in the back of his mind that he now shows up at this rally and out of the blue, you're going to wind up having Tommy Hodges look out at Hawk Newsom where this already confrontation is building. It could go south quickly and Tommy Hodges is going to invite Hawk Newsom onto the stage for two minutes to come and say whatever he wants to say to the crowd. That was going to stun people that Tommy was willing to do that. It stunned Hawk Newsom that he actually did that. And before he went on the stage, he remembered this woman and what she had said. And he found himself praying, Oh God, give me the right words to say. This is a powerful video and we wanted you to see it tonight so that you see it for yourself and what happened with Hawk Newsom, Tommy Hodges, Black Lives Matter, and the mother of all rallies. I want you to see it.
is America. If they don't like that, that's their problem. Let them come on up. Let them come on stage with the black man. I'm gonna let Black Lives Matter come up here while I show them what patriotism is about. Right? It's about freedom of speech. It's about celebration. So what we are gonna do is something you're not used to, and we're gonna give you two minutes of our platform to put your message out. Now, whether they disagree or agree with your message is irrelevant. It's the fact that you have the right to have the message. I am an American. And the beauty of America is that when you see something broke in your country, you can mobilize to fix it. So you ask why there's a Black Lives Matter? Because you can watch a black man die and be choked to death on television and nothing happened. We need to address that. That was a criminal. You need to fix it. That was a criminal. We are not anti-cop. like a bad plumber, like a bad lawyer, like a bad f***ing politician. We don't want handouts. We don't want anything to show us. We want our God-given right to freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All I want to leave you with this, and I'm gone. You're right, my brother. You're right. You are so right. All lives matter, right? But when a black life is lost, we get no justice. That's why we say black lives matter. That's why we say black lives matter. If we really want to make America great, we do it together. All right. USA! USA, 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 USA. It kind of restored my faith in some of those people because when I spoke truths, they agreed. I feel like we had, we made progress. I feel like two sides that never listened to each other actually made progress today. Did I expect to go on that stage? No. I expected to come down here, stand here with my fist in the air in a very militant way and to exchange insults, maybe some dirty looks or who knows what. If, if not on a grander level, but just person to person, you know, I think, I think we really made made some, some substantial steps without either side yielding anything. Yeah. I hope that they understand that one of the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement is a proud American and a Christian who cares deeply about this country, who cares deeply about the people in it, whether they are documented or not. I want them to understand that we are educated, right? That we, that we apply a strategy, but we come from a place of love, right? And we really are here to help this country move toward a better place, not to destroy it. A man who controls a 4,000 member militia shook my hand and said, I always knew I identified with you, but today solidified it. Wow. One of the heads of Breakers for Trump came up and shook my hand, asked me to take a picture with his son. A little blonde head kid named Jacob, like, that's special. Like, here I went from being their enemy to someone they want to take pictures with their children, and that's the power of communication. We came out, we were going to chant, we were going to do a demonstration, but we didn't have to. We just spoke, and it worked. I'm happy about that. That powerful video uh, got over 11 million views as of the publication date of Arthur Brooks' book. Now, what happened after Hawk Newsom spoke, one woman reached out and gave him an American flag. As he came off stage, several people embraced and hugged him. This was before COVID. Uh, there was one man who was the leader of a 4,000 person militia group. And he noticed a bandana 
around Hawk Newsom's hand. It turned out that Hawk had cut his hand when he was using a box cutter, opening a box of signs, and he sliced into his hand. He didn't have time to bandage it uh, before he needed to go out, and so he just wrapped a bandana around it, and when he was coming off stage, it had bled through the bandana. And so this leader of a militia group called him over, and he started caring for his wound. He bandaged, he bandaged it for him. I mean, just incredible when you think of it, of this, this man kind of like the Good Samaritan, people from opposite viewpoints, from uh, sides that were thought to be enemies, were now caring for each other. There was another man named Kenny Johnson. Kenny Johnson is the leader of a group called Bikers for Trump. And in the book, he's described as looking at like one of the Sons of Anarchy actors. <laughs> Just kind of this big uh, brood of a guy, has tattoos, wearing leather, just looked tough and rough. Well, when Hawk came by, he called him over and he said, um, he was just so impressed with the speech that he had a young boy that he would, uh, wanted Hawk to meet, this little blonde hair boy named Jacob. And he asked Hawk to pick him up so they could all take a picture together. You wouldn't have thought that would have ever happened, but because people were willing to think differently, um, absolutely it happened. And Kinney Johnson was interviewed after that picture was taken, and he said, I feel that what he said came from his heart when he went on stage. I probably agree with 90% of what he said. I listened to him with much love, respect, and honor, and I got that back. So far as I'm concerned, he's my brother now. Now, one of the very sad things is that Hawk shared that since that speech where he got up on stage at this rally, that he has received a lot of negative feedback from other Black Lives Matters members. They have called him every name. Uh, they have called him a traitor. One person called him a KKK-loving Trump supporter. Someone else said that he committed treason. Many have stopped talking to him at all because they think he sold out in uh, being there with the enemy, as they would call it. But Hawk didn't let that change him. He decided that something needed to be done differently. He wasn't going to give in from his own peer pressure, from people that he agreed with. He said... I wrestled with myself for a few months. I decided I'd rather go with love. I'm not out to blast people anymore. I'm not out to argue, to fight. I'm there to make people understand, to make people come together. I'm here for progress. He wasn't the only one. Tommy Hodges had his life changed by the experience as well. And he said, it's time to bring people together and get everybody to celebrate America together. So if you are an American, no matter what color, creed, demographic, political belief, if you're an American and love this country, come out and celebrate with us. We need to set a new standard. It's time that people shake hands and agree to disagree. And if people can't do that, this country is going to fall apart. Tommy and Hawk both chose love. You know, I, there is a reason that this thing went so viral. I mean, in no time at all, millions were watching it and forwarding it on. And it's because of what you were just saying. People are hungering for this whole idea that people who may look different and be thinking different, well, really... So many of us want the same sort of a thing. I can agree with 90% of what they had to say. You know, I, I love Martin Luther King's statement when he said, you know, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. I'm going to choose love. And I think that's such an important word, and that's what we started to see happening in this video and what can happen in the world. And to understand that people on either extreme 
are not going to like it because there's too much invested in the anger and the hate and what's going on than when people start coming together and going, no, wait a minute, you could be my brother even though we are different. And so we get pushback from the far right or the far left as people of the right and left come together and say, you know, we really could get to know one another and to love each other and what a difference that would wind up being. I, I thought it was just such a powerful and important video. And you know, one of the things I, I really did like in the video, I know there's so many people who have a, I was a part of a discussion not long ago, just to be very transparent, I was a part of a, of a discussion, people from across the country, small group of us, about 35 or so, and we had a Zoom meeting going on and things were coming up about how do we treat one another and this issue of racial struggles and injustice going on in our country. And the issue of Black Lives Matter came up. And, and people were saying, I don't really understand this. You know, well, I believe blue lives matter. And someone else said, well, I believe white lives matter. All lives matter. I thought what Hawk Newsom said in that video was really so right on and was, I thought, a very helpful statement when he said, you're absolutely right. All lives matter. And that means black lives matter too. It's not like just black lives matter. Black lives matter too. And how often we see things happen that makes it look like black lives don't matter and justice doesn't seem to be applied in an even way. And so it's really a statement of all we want to say is black lives matter too. I thought Hawk brought a really great statement there. And I know the conversation that I was in, there were all these different opinions that were going on and what does this actually mean? All lives really do matter. And that means black lives matter too. When we talk about loving people, I can talk about loving uh, my daughter, Hannah. Saying that I love Hannah doesn't at all negate the love that I have for my husband or my son. Black Lives Matter doesn't negate that all lives matter. We're focusing on where the need for justice is, uh, especially right now at this moment. Arthur C. Brooks has a quote, and the funny thing is, I found this quote in an article I was reading a few years back, and I loved it. And I just happened to buy the book, Love Your Enemies. And then as I was reading, there's the quote. And it was good to reconnect with it. But the quote is, we don't have a problem with anger in American pro uh, politics. We have a contempt problem. Now, a lot of times we think anger is the problem. It's not. There's a lot of reasons to be angry. There are plenty of reasons to be angry, but contempt is the problem. Contempt is anger mixed with disgust. Social scientists describe it as um, this anger mixed with disgust that eliminates any options for a relationship. There's no opportunity for forgiveness, reconciliation. You don't want to be in a relationship with someone you have contempt for. In the book, he lists the quote by the 19th century philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, contempt is the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of another. Now we're all Americans and I can tell you that contempt is dividing our country. It, it's undermining the greater good. We know that the contempt that flows between two divided political parties doesn't improve the overall good. But first and foremost, before we're Americans, we're Christians. And contempt has no place in our lives. Now, what are the things that give way to contempt? We're going to talk about these things in the coming sessions of looking down on one another, belittling, name-calling. But the opposite is to realize that everyone is loved by God. Martin Luther King Jr. was committed to social justice. 
but the method he employed was one of nonviolence. And he and the, the uh, Congressman John Lewis, who passed away uh, this past year, were committed to this way of nonviolence because they weren't just in civil rights for the rights of themselves. They were in it for the transformation of the world because first and foremost, they were Christian and they wanted to follow the way of Christ. And so even in times where they were being beaten, they wouldn't fight back because they didn't want just to earn some rights. They wanted to transform the hearts of even the oppressors. We're called to follow Christ and have that kind of Christ-like love in our lives. Contempt has no place for us as followers of Christ. We're called to follow with our whole heart and lives to truly love our enemies. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to have a good time as we go through this, and we're going to be looking at what goes on with 24-hour cable news stations, what goes on with social media, what are all the different factors that are happening in our lives and how can we find a sense of meaning and peace and help to bring healing in our country and do our part. We hope to see you right back here again next week. Have a great one.